Before we get started, uh, please close your eyes for three seconds. Imagine yourself in the 60s in the South, segregated South. That was me in Rhodesia, my home country. I was not free, but I was born there. I lived in so much fear of the colonial system, and I saw so many people getting traumatized, being sent to jail for weird reasons, having police dogs sent upon them. Freedom was at a cost, and that, that was a big price for one to be free. Military colors traumatized me, and I lived in so much hatred of the system. It would get dark every day at 6 o'clock in the evening, and that was it. We all had to get indoors. My friends and I would be playing on the streets during daytime, kicking our soccer balls, running our hearts out. But at 6 o'clock, we all knew to be indoors. And that was our life as black people in Rhodesia when I was growing up there in the 70s. The white minority in Rhodesia controlled everything. They took the mineral resources, had the, all the best farmland, ran the industries, and kept to themselves in their own neighborhoods, schools, and churches. Black people were their sources of cheap labor, were a resource to be controlled. Whites could be abusive to black people for no reason. A white teenager could even tell my own father to pick up some trash and would just do it, otherwise things would not go well. So there was a bush war going on in the village between the freedom fighters and the colonial government. So in the village, it was wise or wisdom to stay indoors at night to be safe, because all around you, it was a better ground at night. We lived in the city, but would often go to the village to visit my grandparents. So one day when I was about seven and we were visiting there, we heard the sound of a helicopter. I looked up and I saw the body of a man dangling from the helicopter. My parents explained to me that that body was of a man who had been killed fighting for freedom. Even then, I could understand the repeated message from the helicopter megaphone. This is what you get if you fight the government. This is what you get if you fight the government. At another point in the village, my mom and other women were washing clothes at the demo. She had my young brother on the sling behind her, and I was playing beside her. There came a group of soldiers with their little boy. And they stood at a house and asked the little boy, which one of these women knows about the terrorists? They asked the little boy. The little boy didn't know us or anything about us. But he had to do something. And out of fear, he pointed at my mom. The soldiers whisked my mom aside for interrogation but she denied knowing anything about anyone. They asked and asked, but they could not get what they were looking for. One of the soldiers took out his gun and rubbed the sharp edge of his gun on my young brother's soft head. He started crying as he bled and cried helplessly. And one of the soldiers said, well, if you don't tell us what we need, Maybe your baby will die. They questioned my mom for a very long time until eventually they did not get what they were looking for, and they finally gave up and let us go. My dad would tell us freedom was coming, but we had to be sure who was actually fighting for us. We just hope, my dad would say, when that happens, someone who actually looks like us and represents our interests will be in charge of this country. 
And when that happens, you can go to all those good schools, neighborhoods, uh, swimming pools, and movie theaters. That's what I wanted, that's what I was looking for, to be free in my own country of birth. So finally, 18 April 1980 came. That was our Independence Day. Everything felt so different in 1980. People were excited, and they came out of this, on the streets celebrating, sharing food, drinks, dancing, celebrating. Even those with boombox radios could go on treetops, roof, rooftops. They didn't even know what to do with their freedom. We all listened on the radio as they did the transfer of power in the National Sports Stadium. Prince Charles was there, who is now the King of England. He, he lowered the Union Jack British flag and raised the new Zimbabwe flag. Robert Mugabe, the first black prime minister of Zimbabwe, took oath of office and he gave a speech calling for reconciliation and peace. Everyone was so excited. Ian Smith, the defeated Rhodesian prime minister, left the country to boycott the event and went to South Africa. That was the other hub of apartheid. Bob Marley, the reggae icon from Jamaica, flew into Zimbabwe with his whalers and gave us a song that is specially written for the occasion called Zimbabwe. Every man has a right to decide his own destiny. And in this judgment, there is no partiality. We got a liberate Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. There was nothing to match that moment. I told myself that was an open check for me to do whatever I want. I wanted to feel how it would be like to be in those whites only places just to get on the streets and walk feeling free. So my cousins and I wanted to test the waters of the new freedom. So we told ourselves, how about we go to the Minnesin movie theaters? They were once whites only movie theaters. So we went there, but we knew before liberation, those were some of the streets you hardly walked because of racism big city-imposing buildings whose, whites, whose insides were only known by white people. So at the Minnesin entrance, a black man sold tickets. He realized our new arrival status. So he stepped aside to help us, explain to us what to expect from inside. He even explained to us how the seats had to be folded before you sat on them. We were so happy. With drinks and popcorn in our hands, we walked into the theater. Our eyes were looking at the decorated walls, the comfortable blue velvet seats, and the shorts for the upcoming movies. There were white people there, too, watching movies just like us, in the same building, same room. Finally, I felt we were part of the system. If you've been to a place where you've been denied access before, you may feel like you're in a dream. That's how I felt that day. I felt I was like in heaven, but I was free. After high school, I went to college and eventually became a lawyer. By 1995, people were starting to distrust the new government for some reason. Inflation was skyrocketing. And there were too many opponents of the government dying through mysterious circumstances. Tribalism was becoming an issue. With the rape, torture, mass beatings, and also destruction of villages, especially on the southern part of the country. In 1998, I got married. My wife and I had grown up in the same neighborhood and had gone to the same primary school. Our son was born the next year. One weekend, I decided to visit my brother-in-law, who was a policeman at the northern border with Mozambique. We wore our T-shirts labeled for the opposition party, the Movement for Democratic Change. For personal safety, I had worn that shirt only at night when I was in the city. 
But that day, because I was in a remote place, I did not think much about it. A few days later, I was surprised my brother-in-law was summoned to the police head office. He was accused of supporting the opposition party while in police uniform. He eventually had to flee the country and went to Botswana, where he eventually suffered a mysterious death. As a lawyer in my country, I handled many cases for the opposition party. I knew it was dangerous. A few successful cases could make you a subject of stalking. I could see same faces in familiar clothes from one court building to the next. Even at night, I could receive calls saying, "Why are you still representing those people?" Then the phone would hang up. I began living in fear. It all came to a head in the late summer of 2000. I got two anonymous early morning phone calls, and the voice behind it had a crazy laughing, and a man's voice would come in and say, "You think you are safe? Ha <laughs> ha." That would leave me so sweaty. One morning, I found a blue envelope with no stamp in my mailbox at the entrance to my house. Somebody had entered my yard during the night and dropped off the letter. The inside message was handwritten and simple: "You can keep running, but you cannot hide." In Zimbabwe, at that time, if you got that kind of message. It was more than like a smoke detector alarm. It was time for us to leave. We, we had savings, so we left Zimbabwe on a tourist visa with my family, arriving in Dallas, Texas, on Thanksgiving Day in 2000. We found Dallas kind of colder than we expected, coming from a tropical country. <laughs> <laughs> Even then,、uh, we realized Dallas was not like the America we'd watched on TV and in other ways too. <laughs> But we added twins to our family, and suddenly we had three young kids in the family. We worked call center jobs and trained ourselves to live within our means. We also had to program ourselves to avoid luxuries. Even if we turned the heat down, it was okay. It's better be cold than to live in fear. We applied for asylum, but then I wanted also to get to the job and career that I trained for. So I went back to Willamette University and got a law degree, and started working legal jobs. Besides all that, I just felt like I lost something. I lost a lot. I lost my country. I lost fame and career I could have enjoyed as a lawyer in Zimbabwe. As a young lawyer at the time, there were just a few of us during our time because it was just after independence. The law school admitted only 40 kids a year. I was thinking maybe I would have had a better chance to have a good pick of important cases, cases that made a difference in my country. And when I came to the U.S., the land of the free, I thought there was no racism; everything would be fair. Guns would be locked up, and police would be doing their job. <laughs> But here too, I realized there was there was there were issues with racism. While it would not have been blatant, it would also still make me feel unwelcome in some places. And I realized justice too depends on what you look like. But sometimes in life, you take your losses so that the future can be better. If not for us, for our kids. Growing up, my wife and I missed some of the opportunities to go to some of the best private schools in the country because they were segregated and expensive. We had to go to boarding schools because they were welcoming and affordable. Here. Even if my kids were little, I realized they had an opportunity to go to some of the schools of choice. 
So I wanted them to take advantage of that. So I would continually tell them in my language, that means don't play with school. To any parent, there is no greater joy than in seeing your kids grow up, be smart, kind, and successful. They did not mess around with school. <laughs> One child, our daughter, is about to graduate as a designer, and the other girl, the twin, and our son have completed their first degrees and are moving towards studying to become attorneys. I'm proud of each of them as a parent. In my little world, their success story completes my American dream. Therefore, I believe I won. Thank you.